It wasn't until uh, last year we played Welcome to Rockville in Daytona. Uh-huh. Uh, Metallica played, all these big bands played, and uh, my dad had texted me uh, saying, I'm proud of you. And wow. I, that's all I ever wanted mm-hmm. was for my, for my dad to say that. My mom understood the journey as we went on. And it's not like a validation I need from dad. Mm-hmm. It was more so to be like, hey, I told you I had it. I told you I was going to get through it. And for him to say that proved to me that he finally understands that I knew what I wanted. And he should be happy that he came to this country for me. Mm-hmm. And I feel fulfilled that I, I guess, made my parents' dream come true where I'm going to become something of myself. doesn't have to do with fame, but I'm not going to be a homeless person on the road um, I'm going to be somebody to someone or something and that they came to this country for a day. Discipline is simple. It's just remembering what you want. So don't forget to always prioritize what they can't see. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to Rise Above, where you'll be able to hear, learn, and grow from individuals who have rose above their circumstances, which led them to what they define as success. First and foremost, I want to thank all of the listeners for all the support for the premiere of this podcast. Honestly, this would have not been possible with without every single one of you. Now, I've been fortunate and blessed to be surrounded by incredible individuals who are willing to be open to let us in about details of their lives. From the changes and transformations they've made, we have the opportunity to not only learn, but apply them to our lives and the challenges we may encounter ourselves. And today's guest truly has an inspiring story that I'm excited to share with you. He has two immigrant parents that took a chance to come to the US and give their son a better life. From dropping out of high school to becoming the drummer of a major up and coming band, Fame on Fire, he's done nothing less than fight for his dreams. The CEO and founder of Roman Films and the man that takes every idea I have for content and brings it to life, none other than Alex Roman. Alex, appreciate you being on the show. Thank you for doing this for me, brother. Dude, thank you so much. <clears throat> so um, I was thinking about this yesterday when we were having the conversation and I was like, man, like, how long have we have we known each other? It's been a while. I'd, I'd say like five and a half years, maybe. Five and a half years. And I was like, when I was thinking about this, I was like, man. When we had our conversation, pre-podcast conversation, I was like, man, I've only known you as the drummer, the filmmaker, but I want the listeners to know, who is Alex behind all of that? Uh, I'm just, I consider myself to be like a regular person, you know, like I don't take titles or anything to my name, like mm-hmm. filmmaker and drummer, I mean like everybody has a title and to me I feel like I'm just like everybody else, but I'm a just determined person that just, I know what I want. And I'm going to get what I want when I want it. And that's just kind of who I am as a person. I wouldn't label myself anything. I would have named myself better, you know, or more talented. I would actually consider it to be the opposite, less talented the way I think of it. I just have a determination at another level, in my opinion, compared to what people say they want when they want to do something or when they want to get something. That's huge. And you said uh, a determination on another level. Where, where do you say that? That, that determination roots from I honestly would say it's people from people telling you you can't do something you're never going to get there you're never going to be able to do this and there's nothing that fuels me more in life than somebody telling me hey Alex you can't do something or you can't get something internally it just lights a gas in my, in my system like lights me on fire I'm like you know what I'm going to prove you wrong just to say I proved you wrong no I'm not trying to win anything it's just to prove it to myself and to be like hey I told you so and I think having um, immigrant parents and having the minority background, I think we all kind of work with this chip on our shoulder, I guess. You know what I mean? 100%. We just carry that. We carry that around. And um, I know you told me a little bit about kind of where you're from and um, how it's basically as good as winning the lottery for you to be here today. Um, tell us a little bit about your roots, where you're from, where your parents are from. Yeah. So I was born in uh, Cairo, Egypt. I lived there until about six years old. So, uh, long story short in summary, we were talking about it Mm -hmm. yesterday. Um, my mom was studying abroad in Italy and she went to Egypt for vacation with her girlfriends just to kind of get away for the weekend or Mm -hmm. so. And she ended up staying at the hotel where my dad's friend had owned the hotel. And uh, long story short, my mom went back to Italy. She went back to the United States to where my grandmother was living at the time. 
And she went back to Egypt and she married my dad. <laughs> That's and crazy. Here I am. <laughs> and my mom lived in Egypt for about 13 or 14 years, learned the full language, learned the full culture. And, um, here I am. That's, that's actually, that's, that's, that's amazing. Cause I, for my, for my story itself, I mean, I have a very similar story. My father's from India. My mother's from um, South America, two immigrant parents. And, and they came to the U S to just have a better, uh, just give me a better life essentially. And, um, that's huge. I mean, that's that, that itself probably fuels a lot of what you, what you probably do today and the, the way you operate today. Um, but I, you, when you were speaking to me yesterday, I know you talked a lot about your support system and your mom being your support system. Um, just tell me a little bit about, about that and your relationship with your mother. Yeah. So, uh, I have no shame saying it. growing up as a kid, I was definitely like a mama's boy. <laughs> me too, man. A hundred percent. And, uh, I think the reason I kind of cling to my mom more was in our culture, the Egyptian culture that I grew up, they're very stern. They're very, uh, not difficult, but they're it's kind of their way of the highway. And I definitely have that mentality. I definitely have that as a part of my characteristic and trait, good and bad. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think my mom understood that being like your children, understanding your children on a different level, really grasped that. She grasped that really well. And to me, I was like, okay, well, my mom understands if I say, hey, I want to have long hair or, hey, I want to wear a different shirt. She wouldn't judge me per se. She'd be like, okay, let's try this. She'll find a way to make a happy medium between the culture and what's acceptable. And this was like in Egypt. And then when we moved over here, it's kind of a free for all. I mean, this is the free country. And the whole Absolutely. reason of being free is to do who you want, be who you want, and not be judged. But you have to remember, my parents were in their 30s when they moved here. So for my dad to change overnight, it's, it's not going to happen. Right. And um, my mom understood that at a much younger age than my dad did. And in no shame to my dad because my dad helped me be the man that I am today. Um, but my mom definitely nurtured me more into letting me be who I want to be. That's huge, man. That's huge. And I think um, uh, being able to have that balance and having that support, I mean, if both parents were, you know, against what you were doing or or against the, the decisions that you made, I think life would have been a, a lot harder. So having that support system is, is huge. But um, how did your... How did your, I guess, what's the other side of the coin? Your father, right? Tell us a little bit about your father and how he was different than, than your mother. So my dad was uh, more strict, more stern, uh, still loving and caring. He mm-hmm. was never like, you know, beating us or like, yelling at us, like nothing like that. But he was more old school. So it was his or the highway. So, and, and rightfully so. I mean, like it's his home. It's his kingdom, as I call it. And uh, it's his rules. So you have to live by them. But me having that fire determination in me, I always had like a, a will to just do whatever I want and I would always challenge my dad my dad never really liked that and nobody else challenged my dad but me Um, and uh, so my dad and I have never had a rocky relationship but we understood each other in that regard and my dad you know he helped me you know become a strong person he helped me become a very self uh, determined person he also taught me how to have thick skin Um, and I think a lot of people do not have thick skin nowadays and they're just offended by a lot of things and you know they're just things bother them a lot easier than it should and that still happens to me too not saying i'm not susceptible to that but i definitely don't care what people think about me if you don't like me cool you know if you don't like the way i dress or the way i look or whatever that's totally fine Mm -hmm. do you i'll do me and i think i learned that more so from my dad uh on the i guess harsher side and then from my mom's side i learned that it's okay to be accepted or not be accepted by other people Rather than just saying like "fuck you," like I don't even right. think about right, right, right. No, I think that's huge of being able to have that balance and um, being from the being from that kind of culture, right? I mean, I, I've got a lot of cultural norms from um, where my parents are from. Um, where do you where do you get that that sh- inner strength to go against the grain? Because I mean, from what I know, in a lot of cultures, when you're when you're not you know doing the standard, hey, go to college, get a degree, get a good job. Make sure you're saving up so you can support your family and get married. Like the, the typical cultural norms, right. right? But when you're going against the grain, it's a huge slap in the face for that for that oh, yeah. for that culture and for that uh, um, uh, for that for those for those specific traditions and stuff. Um, what is what was it like, like day in and day out, to be able to constantly go against the grain and 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 your family? I mean, quote unquote, I'm not saying they weren't supporting you, but your dad not really supporting that. Right. Uh, I always call it as like a war zone in my house, like. I always explain to people this way. Imagine 
you being 30, right? You have this whole life in America and then you move to a whole other country for your children or for whatever reason. And that reason you went for that, let's just say it's kids, they do the complete opposite of you. So it was a, to my parents, both my mom and my dad, very disrespectful, especially in the culture. And my parents grew up religious. Mm. So we would go to church and, you know, the whole nine. And I'm not really a religious person. So to me, I thought I was doing what I wanted to do. To my parents, it's like, hey, you're being disrespectful and you're not caring why we actually came to this country. And it was always a fight. Everything was always a fight. Everything was always a battle because I was going to do what I wanted to do, not what they wanted me to do. Uh, and that's pretty much how it was like for like five and a half, six years in the house. It was wow. just them against me. And when I say them, it's both my parents because my mom can't side with me because she's, you know, it's kind of like you, she just can't, you know. Right. Um, but she would also on the side be like, I understand where you're coming from, but you have to understand where we're coming from. Right. Um, and I understood that, but I still went against whatever my parents told me just because I knew what I wanted. I just, I had this feeling. And like I mentioned earlier, I'm so self-determined and I was like, I'm going to do what I want to do and I'm going to get to it when I get to it. I love that. And is there, would you say there's like a, a mentor that you've watched or listened to, or is it your mom or your dad where you were able to get that like characteristic where you're just going to do whatever you want to do, make the decisions you want to make and fight for your dreams? So, I mean, when I was growing up around that time, I forget what, I was like 13, 14. There's not, I mean, YouTube was a thing, but I really yeah, didn't, it wasn't like what it is today. Right, right. So I don't think I had anybody to kind of like look up to or anything in that regard. Um, I actually never met both my grandparents and they were okay. both uh, entrepreneurs and business like minded. Wow. And um, I always ask my mom, like, where did I kind of get those like skills from? Where did I get that from? And I think I got it from them, to be quite honest with you. I mean, I can't ask them that, obviously, but from what my parents explained to me and they both created their own kind of like industries and what they did i think that's kind of where i got it from and i i guess i have that gene in my blood from that because my parents aren't entrepreneurs they work the nine to five so i always ask that question even till this day i mean i I have conversations with my mom about uh, my grandfather on her side and my grandfather on my dad's side and i think that's kind of where i got it from and just self-determination to prove a point to my parents I think that's kind of what fueled right. me. Um, and then obviously everybody in school being, you know, the Egyptian, everybody called me Egypt actually in middle school, which is kind of <laughs> yeah, funny. That is. Yeah, which is kind of funny. And uh, I like that. I think it was cool being the odd one out. And I, I, I always like gravitated to that. Not to be like, oh, he's weird. Um, even if you thought I was weird, I thought it was cool to be weird in the time. Like I never got a, a bothered or offended by somebody saying something about me or my culture. That's, I mean, that's, that's huge being able to have that. I think it's a level of self-esteem when growing up and being able to, like you said, you probably got that from your dad, that thick skin, like nothing really bothered bothered you. You don't really care about judgment. Right. Um, it is what it is. You like me, you like me, you don't, you don't. Um, and I think that's what a lot of people suffer with, with like social conformity and all these things that people go through because of social media and that. So um, that's, that's huge. And um, when we're thinking about, when we're talking about, um, you know, fighting for your dreams and, 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 making decisions that Alex wants and um, just doing what you doing what you love to do. One thing I noticed about you is you never really ever talk about money or chasing the money. When we were speaking yesterday, there was not a point in your story that you said, you know, I was doing this because of the money or I was chasing the money. Um, where do you get that from and how did you how did you manage to operate like that? So again, I'm gonna go back between Egypt and like living here. So mm-hmm. growing up in Egypt I mean, my parents gave us everything we ever wanted in the world. We weren't rich, but we were well off. We had maids. Like, we had the whole nine living nice. in Egypt. So, again, I only lived there until I was six, so it wasn't like that long you know, lived, essentially. But moving to this country, moving here, I started really seeing how life was different mm-hmm. and how money would affect people and how it would change. And, I mean, who doesn't want to be rich? Who doesn't want to have right. all the money in the world? And, I mean, that was always a thought in my head growing up. It would be nice to have this, 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 and this. Um but I never really cared about money at that time. It never really meant anything to me. All I cared for was what I wanted to do, and I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have been able to do it had I not had a roof over my head, which is what my parents provided: food, shelter, uh, and comfortability to to go out and do what I want. So money was never really in the back of my mind. Like shiny objects were like never like my target point. That kind of came later in my life. Um, when I started seeing success with all my stuff. And I mean, that's a different kind of story we could talk about. But at the early stages, it was never about like, hey, 
you know, I can't wait to make 50 bucks so I can go buy, you know, like food for myself yeah. or go buy a t-shirt or something. It was more like, hey, I want to make money so I can keep doing what I wanted to do. That's, I mean, that's that, that's huge. And um, having that instilled um, at such a young age, I mean, usually you see people that, you know, come from, I'm not saying you, you, you're you rich or what, but you, you're well off in Egypt, right? So being right. well off in Egypt. Um, and, and then there's a part of your story where, you didn't have any of that, right? right? And um, I want to I want to unpack that a little bit. But first, the biggest turning point in your story um, that I want you to talk about is um, when tenth grade rolled around oh. and <laughs> you decided to not go back to school. So uh, I, w- I want you to t- touch on that a little bit. Yeah. So I obviously the ninth grade freshman year, tenth mm-hmm. grade came around. I remember summer. I was just thinking to myself, like school is just so stupid. Like I just don't want to go to to school. Right. It was just dumb. Um, so 10th grade came around. I did the first semester and I really struggled through the first semester. And my parents saw that. I mean, they obviously, I would go to school late. I wouldn't go to school. I would purposely fail my classes just because I didn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so second semester was about to start. I think it's like in the new year. I think, I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure it's around the right. new year. Right. And I walked up to my mom and said, hey, I'm not going back to school. It's like I literally dropped like a nuke in my house. It was like literally like an explosion <laughs> happened in my house. And my mom goes, what do you mean you're not going back to school? I'm like, I'm not going to school. Like, I don't like it. It's a waste of my time. It's stupid. I know what I want to do, which is I want to play drums. I want to be a rock star, mom. It's what I want to do. I'm not going back to school. So it was like a back and forth. I never actually ended up going back. I think I went back for like a week, and then I told my mom, I'm not going back. So my parents and I came to a compromise, which is FLVS, Florida Virtual School, yeah. for me to do from home. Okay. And I started doing that. Uh, and then I also came to realize about six months into that, that you can do it at your own pace, but you still have to show up on their time. Right. They're, you know, they're, it's always on them. And I came to realize quickly that I hate doing something for somebody else on their time when I could be spending time on myself doing it on my time, my way. So then I told my parents, I'm not doing this anymore. This shit's stupid. Again, another nuke blew up in my house. It's like, what do you mean? So you, imagine. You're going back to school. I was like, I'm not going back to school. It was about a year at that point, six months to a year. I've had the freedom to work or it's not work to study from home and wake up when I want and do what I want. And, um, at that point, I think I was like 15. I, I, don't, I don't know what age was. Mm-hmm. My parents said you either get a job or you go back to school. Mm-hmm. So a transition to starting work at work. a young age. Yeah. Nice man. And, um, wow. Uh, that is, that, that needs you need a whole lot of courage to come home and tell your parents you're not going back to school. Oh yeah. Um, and when you said you wanted to tell your mom, I mean, when you sorry, when you told your mom you wanted to be a rock star, um, what was the reaction to that? She was like not like shunned or like like worried or scared. It was more so the fact like, okay, that's a cool idea, like <laughs> that's a cool hobby. Go to school, do your thing, and on the side. Play drums right. into your thing. Like, kind of like your typical parent right. would do. Um, it wasn't, you know, she probably thought it was like a phase, I would say, mm-hmm. more than anything. Because my brother was a drummer, too. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason why I'm a drummer. Um, it was because of that. So I think she kind of thought it was a phase. I'm kind of fade away. She was encouraging about it, but just made sure that I went to school to get a, a good good sense of, like, school, I guess. I don't know. Right. No, of course. Of course. I mean, just just this, this thing, they, our parents think that getting an education is a huge part of our success and I, what they don't realize is that times have changed so much that it doesn't that, matter. yeah it doesn't matter i mean you can be self-taught with everything that you do which gets me to the next part that i want to talk to you about um you said your brother was a drummer as well yep. um you got to see that growing up um how did you how did you stumble upon wanting to become a drummer how did that whole situation come about yeah so uh, i had broken my wrist i didn't didn't even tell you the story how i broke my wrist oh no no it's the dumbest story on the planet (laughs) i was skateboarding outside Uh i hit the mailbox and it fell and snapped my wrist literally the dumbest way to break a it's not even even a good story i wish it was a good story yeah it's a stupid story (laughs) so i broke my wrist and um got a cast of the whole thing and i stayed home for a few days and i'm the younger brother my brother says hey don't touch my drum set I remember my dad and my brother going to Sam Ash in Pompano, and they bought the drum set. It's a Tama drum set. Uh-huh. They brought it home, and my brother's like, hey, don't touch my drum set. It's mine. Mind you, we shared a room. We had bunk beds. Uh-huh. Um, so everybody was gone. I was home by myself. Mm-hmm. I saw the drum set. It's like this big, shiny thing that says, don't touch me. I'm going to go touch it. Uh, I put the drumstick in the cast, 
and I would start kind of like playing like this for a little bit just to kind of like get the feel because like obviously my wrist I couldn't hold it right and uh, I was around ten years old around that time ish and uh, from then I never ever dropped a pair of drumsticks till today. Wow, that's amazing. And I mean, you weren't kidding about your your rebel personality, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they tell you not to do it, you're doing yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> everything my especially my family told me not to do, I would do the opposite. But the drum set always intrigued me. It always sounded cool. It always looked cool. And every time I watch my brother play, I'm like, "Yo, that's cool. Like, how do you do that?" You do it, so I think right. that intrigued me more than wanting to rebel. But the fact that I couldn't touch it, plus that interest, made me go after uh, playing the drum set. So, were you playing the drums um, before you told your mom you wanted to be a rock star? Yes. Okay. Yep. Awesome. And then, um, like I was, so we were talking about education, right? And how um, it's just such a standard that our parents want us to go through the educational process, go to school because they want us to learn certain things for us to be successful. Um, did you learn the drums on your own? Did you take classes? Did you have an instructor? I just self-taught myself. I would listen to a song and I would hear it and I would start understanding what what hit was or what snare or crash or tom, what would it be? And I would just start playing it by ear and I just self-taught myself till. Wow. Well, no. So that's I've amazing. A lesson, yeah. That's amazing. I mean, you see that nowadays. I mean, a lot of people. YouTube University is what I call that, it. That's exactly. I, I mean, didn't have that back then. And and you can literally just look up anything, get an answer for anything you want, learn anything you want. So, um, that's huge. Now, I know you got. I know you're a part of a band called Fame on Fire, and yep. um, you had a very a very interesting story on how you guys actually came about from, and it's it's over years yep. that you guys uh uh went from you know I guess playing in a garage to going on tour. Um, tell me a little bit about um, Fame on Fire and how you guys got to where you got to today. Yeah, so they're actually my childhood best friends in sixth grade. Uh, the guitar player, Blake, the singer, Brian, and myself all went to the same middle school. We met our bass player a few years down the road. Uh, well, way years down the road at that point. Um, but we grew up together. We were in multiple bands in, in uh, middle school. Uh, some of the dumbest names possible. Uh, like Category 9 was one of them. It's just like, actually, Blake still has, I think, a drum hat that we have. It says Category 9, which is so funny. So I, I've been friends with them since sixth grade, and they're literally like my brothers from another mother. Like, we know everything about each other. And um, long story short, growing up in high school, everybody wants to be in a band, and it was a cool thing, battle the bands, all that type right. of stuff. So fast forward to after high school, the boys uh, went up to Orlando. Blake and Brian moved to Orlando. I stayed down here. I didn't have any money to move up. My parents couldn't afford to move me to Orlando. So I just stayed down here working, doing my thing. Uh, Unconditionally uh, by Katy Perry kind of popped up on the radio. I don't really listen to radio, but I heard it. And for some reason, I told myself, I want to do a drum cover to this song. I was starting to watch drum covers on YouTube. I like, It'd be cool if I did that for myself to brand myself as a drummer. Maybe I'll go somewhere one day with it. And... Sent it to Blake, couldn't afford to track drums, so we had the MIDI, which is just made on the computer, so I can just learn it by ear, play it, and then make a video to it myself it. down here. Blake calls me back, goes, hey, what if I put some guitar in it? I was like, yeah, dude, put some guitar in it, I'll drive up to your house in Orlando, we'll film a little video and put it on the internet. And he goes, well, what if we put Brian on the song to sing? I was like, Brian can't sing. Like he, I, he just, he's he's not, another child of uh, Yeah, friend. he's a singer. Oh, he's a singer. Yeah, he's another, and I was like, he can't sing. Uh, I knew he was in choir, but it, I think choir singing is different than rock singing. Um, so then he sends me the track, and I'm like, holy shit, this guy can fucking sing. Uh, I was like, dude, this is crazy. This sounds so cool. I didn't know Brian could sing. Yeah. Uh, we didn't have a bass player, so their roommate, uh, who was also another childhood friend that moved up with them, we just took him, and uh, we went to go shoot the music video for it. And that's exactly how Fame on Fire started. It was just an wow. accident. And I still couldn't tell you that garage we filmed that for unconditionally. Yeah. Have no idea whose garage that is at all. It was just some random garage somewhere when I drove up to Orlando and we filmed uh, unconditionally. And that's how Fame on Fire was born. That's huge. And you said, um, I believe you told me Fame on Fire was established in 2013. Yep. December 2013 was December. the first music video went out. I actually have a fun fact. I have a, a clock on the eye here. Because I moved to the United States December 12th, 2000. Wow. And the first video to ever come out was December 13th, 2013. So That's I had sick. put the, the time That's um, sick. on my on my tattoo. Nice, bro. That's sick. Crazy coincidence. Yeah. And I, and I mean, amazing, amazing story. I think the craziest part is 
these are all your childhood best friends and yeah. now you guys are living the dream i think the biggest thing about success is not not only wanting it for yourself but being able to bring your friends with you or being able to do it with people that you love 100 um, now you've got two completely different paths right you've where we've got fame on fire we've got alex the drummer but tell us a little bit about alex the filmmaker yeah so i picked up filmmaking um to have time for the band every time we would film a music video for the band i always got intrigued by the camera i was like oh this looks cool it always looks cooler on camera right and i just always intrigued me but again i never had the money i never had like the time to really go do something about it i was like oh that's cool whatever and over time as the band started getting some success on the internet the band would start taking a little bit more of my time we'd film more music videos and so on and so forth so i got really really interested by it and our buddy that filmed the stuff at the time, all our, all our music videos, um, I would just watch and watch and watch. And I was like, you know what? I think I can do this. Mm-hmm. I think I could teach myself how to film. Mm-hmm. So I was working at the Apple Store at the time, like yeah, I was telling yeah, you. Uh-huh. Uh, I got this job being a personal assistant slash videographer. Mind you, I am the worst personal assistant on the planet. I can't even take care of myself. <laughs> Uh, and I had no idea how to film. I told this company I knew how to film. I showed them my buddy's uh, uh, YouTube page or his website, uh-huh. and I told them that was my work. And if you want to hire me, here's my work. And I literally lied to them on that I could be a filmmaker. <laughs> and I literally got hired, got fired as a personal assistant within like the first two weeks. I was the worst personal assistant, and I became strictly their content guy. And I taught myself anytime they asked for something – I would YouTube it and I would learn it and I would apply it that same day. Wow. And that's how I learned how to filmmake. Wow. And then um, I guess when did Roman Films come about? Yeah. So I ended up quitting that company. I went back to work at Apple and uh, that uh, owner of that same company went out and did his own other company. Asked me, hey, do you want to go film one of the athletes for us? I was like, sure. Yeah, no problem. Went up to go film the athlete, came back. And when I came back, they offered me a full-time position to be their first videographer ever. I was like, sure. Yeah. I've. I like filming now. I think I can do it. I uh, ended up doing that for some time, but it started conflicting with the band. So I quit. I was like, hey, I'm going to quit because I want to do the band. And the band wasn't anything big at the time. I think maybe we had like 15,000 subscribers, 20,000 subscribers mm-hmm. at the time. And I was like, all right, I'm going to quit. I'm going to film. And when I quit, I actually couldn't afford a camera. Still had no money. And I spoke to the guys in the band like, hey, if the band can pay for half my camera... I'll film all the band's content, and I'll pay for the other half. And right around that time is when we, I received my first paycheck ever as a musician in my entire life, which was $250. So that paycheck went directly towards uh, the ownership of the camera that I had, and I would pay my debt back to the band wow. without getting paid for that time being, and that's how Roman Film started. Wow. Now, they're, like, first of all, that's amazing. and You have this constant theme of, fighting for your dreams and and always had had a had a, had a lot of financial struggle doing it right yeah um i mean just for like the listeners man like what would you what's a what's some something that you can tell them that like that that had that that gave you the courage and and and, and gave you the passion gave you the drive gave you the commitment to be able to continue to fight even though i think you told me like yesterday that it was like two or three years not consistently being able to have money, like just being broke and, yep. and constantly just look being there for the band filming, being there for the band filming. Where, where do you, where do you get all that, all that from? How do you push through all that? I think it's just like wanting to see yourself be successful and kind of for me again, it was proving a point to everybody that, Hey, you can, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it for yourself. You can do it for others. But I think I just like literally flipped a switch on in my brain that said anybody that's in my way that has nothing to do with what I want to achieve, get the fuck out of my way. That's huge. Even my parents, everybody. And I literally said, if you're not part of my journey, you're not going to help me get to where I want to go. Literally just move the fuck out of the way because if you don't, I'm just going to run you over. Mm -hmm. And I think that just like that fire fueled me just to do everything I want to do. And um, that's why I, I started to do things on my own, regardless of whether I liked it or not, whether somebody else liked it or not. I just said I'm going to do it. No, that's and that's huge. And you talk about um, another support system um, that you had that that someone that's been able to see your entire journey, your lady. Yep. Um, tell me, tell me a little bit about your relationship with her and how that's been 
your support system? Yeah, so aside from my parents and uh, my bandmates, of course, uh, my wife now, Melanie, uh, she's been with me literally since day one from before all this started. The band has started already, but before like the band started becoming anything um, to where we are today, she's the only person that's seen it all happen from zero wow. to here. And I wouldn't be here uh, if it wasn't for her in that regard. She's the one that pushed me. She was the one that would help me during those hard times, those dark days where I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. Just because it sounds like I always have the courage and determination. I'm human too. You know, I have bad days. She was the one that told me to quit that job. She was the one that told me to leave Apple. She was the one that told me to stop working for this company and go after it. And she was the one that actually gave me money. Wow. She was... Uh, working as a preschool teacher, she had, I think, three or four grand in her savings account that her family had saved up for her to go to school, and she would give me money over time so I can build my business. And literally, I had nothing. Like, when I say I had nothing, like, I lived at home. I had no money. I had none of that. And for somebody that I had just been with for two years to kind of give everything that they had to me showed so much character uh, about her that kind of it kind of like fell on to me like maybe I should start being a little bit nicer because I was always like an asshole per se because I feel like to be successful you have to be an asshole in my opinion and I mean if somebody takes offense to that I'm sorry right. but I just feel like you have to be self-centered and you have to be kind of about yourself to a certain extent to get where you want to go and for ha to have somebody like her it'd be like hey you can have both and you can still do it kind of open up a new door for me like you know what maybe I don't have to be so hard on myself and to be hard on other people to achieve what I want. That's huge, man. Um, and then, I mean, being on a, a journey like 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 you've gone through and, um, and having that mindset of, you know, whoever's in my way, get out of my way, but still having a support system like her um, to be able to deliver that selflessness that she did and, and, and tell you to, you know, give you the courage to quit your job and give you the courage to follow your dreams um, that is that is huge, and um, to transition over to where is Alex today? Um, I know everything on everybody sees on social media, you know, like like you're touring and and Roman Films is doing good. But what? Where is Alex Roman today? What's what's life like for you? Um, with the success, with you being able to fight for your dreams, um, what is your relationship like with your parents? Just if you can kind of encompass all that. Yeah, so I mean, I'm still doing the same exact thing. Still Roman Films, uh, Fame on Fire has become a pretty big band now. I mean, like we're touring uh, nationally, ho hopefully soon to be internationally. Wow. Uh, with all the COVID stuff, we're. I mean, I'm playing with some of the bands I grew up listening to. Like, I'm going to open up for some of these bands. And to me and to the boys and I, you know, I say, Fame on Fire is not me. Fame on Fire is all of us. Mm -hmm. And it's just crazy to see how far we've come and that we're doing these shows. Actually, Blake, our guitar player, was just on tour with somebody else. And he came back. And he goes, dude, we're always, like, chasing. Like, we can't wait till we make it. And he goes, dude, we've, we've already fucking made it. Like, let's live the dream. And that kind of, like, really clicked with, with us. That's huge. Um, and I was like, when he said that, I was like, you know what? He's like, he's right uh, when it comes to that. But I will say having both businesses, uh, Drummer, Alex Drummer, The Fame on Fire, and, and Roman Films, has become more challenging because they're both very demanding on myself. And I feel like when you build relationships with people, they always want you for everything. And I can't be at two places at one time. but Just if, like me, man. <laughs> yeah, if, if I had to complain about something, that would be my complaint. But aside from that, I'm, I'm living my dream. I'm still you know, doing everything I set out to do in the relationship with my parents. My parents understand everything. They see everything. It wasn't until uh, last year we played Welcome to Rockville in Daytona. Uh -huh. uh, Metallica played. All these big bands played. And uh, my dad had texted me uh, saying, I'm proud of you. And wow. I, that's all I ever wanted mm -hmm. was for my for my dad to say that. My mom understood the journey as we went on, and it's not like a validation I need from dad. Mm -hmm. It was more so to be like, "Hey, I told you I had it. I told you I was gonna get through it." And for him to say that proved to me that he finally understands that I knew what I wanted, and he should be happy that he came to this country for me, mm -hmm. and I feel fulfilled that I, I guess made my parents dream come true where I'm going to become something of myself doesn't have to do with fame but I'm not going to be a homeless person on the road um, I'm going to be somebody to someone mm -hmm. or something 
and that they came to this country for a purpose. Dude, that's um that is huge and I can totally relate to to getting that text message because again, just going back to the cultural norms and, and, and the traditions that 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 you come from, right? Um that's all we want from our parents yeah. because we live up to our parents' expectations of us. Yep. And that's 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 huge. I mean, just to get that text message, I probably that that's enough for the rest of your life. Like that's he, it. He understood. It's like a truce almost. Like this war is over, and you made a good decision taking a chance on me, bringing me here yep. to the U.S. for me to have a better life. So I mean, it's probably amazing. I know you recently just bought a home too. Um, yep. So that's huge, and I'm sure they're proud of you um, for that as well, and seeing all your accomplishments. One thing I did miss, which I wanted to go back to, and I want you to just touch on really quickly, yeah. is um, the record label when you guys got signed in 2017. So just talk about that moment for Fame on Fire. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's 2016 or 17, around that, time, that time. Somewhere around that mm-hmm. time, we got signed. And at that point, we were already an established band. We had a look. Uh, we had the image. We had the songs. We were popular enough for doing covers of pop songs. And for us to get signed was like a, like a milestone for the band, not because, oh, my God, we have a record deal, but it's like, hey, this band happened on accident, and we're building traction and traction that important people are starting starting to see who we are which means okay well if we're creating this type of buzz like maybe we do actually have something and signing uh with a record label was the next milestone for the band and it helped catapult us to the next level to where we are today helped us build the relationships we need and um i mean i leave for tour literally in six days to go tour with one of the world's biggest Japanese rock bands on the planet called One OK wow. Rock. We're the Congrats. openers. We're the openers, but like I always make a joke to like my manager and my buddies, like, hey, if we don't even get on the bill, like I'll play outside the venue. Like, it's like as a joke, like I don't care. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but to be on the bill with any of these bands, um, it's an honor. Hundred percent an honor. Doesn't matter if you're first, the last band, again, you play outside the venue. Um, the fact that people know who we are, the fact that people care about who we are as musicians, still blows my mind till today. Wow, that's huge, man, and that's uh, that's that's an amazing story, especially like knowing that this nothing was planned. No, like, that's the craziest part of the zero. Story. Nothing was planned, and you guys end up living your dreams that you that you probably thought would would continue to be a dream for the rest of your life. And yeah, doing it for fun, doing it as a hobby. Um, so that's that's huge. Now. Um, we're at the last part um, of the podcast, and I know you you saw this last time. So there's something called the final rise. All it is, it's five questions that I'm going to ask you. You either got to answer it in one word or one sentence. That's going to be hard. All right. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't prepare you for this, yeah, but yeah. Uh, they're they're relatable questions. So first question: um, Your most favorite city you played for? That's a that's a good question. Mm-hmm. Most favorite city I've played for so far. I think that one city that was like insane. What city? I, I honestly, I would probably say Denver. Denver. Yeah, if I remember correctly, the Denver crowd was like lit. Yeah. Yeah, it was lit. Nice, 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 awesome. Second question: um, best advice you've ever received? Best advice I've ever received. I, thought, I, I got. I got to take a second to think about. No, of course, of course. Best advice I ever received. Hmm. And it could be. I mean. Mom, dad, anybody that gave it to you, friends, family. I'm just trying to. Yeah, get I'm your... trying to think of a. I'm trying to think. I mean, I had I had a, a buddy of mine kind of once tell me like, dude, if there's something that you want, just just do it. I'm like, who cares what other people think? And I mean, that kind of comes from my dad too. Just chase your dream and don't give up. Chase your dream. That's and that's huge. And I feel like that's the narrative of your entire story. Yeah. Um, someone that you've always looked up to and still look up to today. My parents, the parents, hundred percent. I thought, I thought so. I just, I, 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 not that I have anything to look up to people or anything like that. And right. Today, I have people I look up to, but I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my mom or dad. Obviously, being alive, but I wouldn't be in this country. I wouldn't be who I am. I wouldn't have any these tattoos. I wouldn't, I wouldn't look the way I wouldn't be who I am if it wasn't for my mom and dad. So I give everything to them. That's huge. That's huge. Um, number four, worst advice you've ever gotten. Just give up. You're, you're, just give up. Yeah, you're never going to get anywhere. Give up. Really? You've had somebody tell you that? Oh, yeah. And probably over and over, right? Over. Hundreds of times. Hey, it's, you're never going to get anywhere. Give up. And then final question, which is I'm very interested in listening to your answer. If you can do one of these for the rest of your life, would you be a drummer or would you continue Roman films? Drummer. All day? All day. Hands down. It's funny you ask that because... 
I took like I I fight with myself sometimes like hey maybe I should stop filming so I can spend more time for drumming but I'm like well, if I stop drumming then I can like build this business even crazier and better and I've gotten to a point in life where I don't care about anything in the sense of money materialistic items or things I just want to be happy and I think both of them make me happy but I've always wanted to be a drummer I've always wanted to be a rock quote unquote rock star since I was a kid and I'm starting to live that dream. I'm living that dream with my best friends. Why would I ever give that up? That's huge. That's huge. Um, well, I just want to wrap this up. And one thing that I took from your entire story is the theme of fighting for your dreams. I think success for you has been predicated on living life on your own terms. And one thing that I learned from you is, you know, you can have what you want if you operate like you already have it. And I think you've done that for your entire life you've operated like you were a rock star you operated like you did have the biggest film company and um that's that's huge man that's a that's a true inspiration and i want to um thank you for being on the on the show man thanks for having um, me appreciate it you delivered a ton of value and uh um look forward to having you back in the future dude appreciate it thank you of course brother discipline and simple it's just remembering what you want So don't forget to always prioritize what they can't see.